I don't <laughs> quite know. I just noticed that one of the core mechanics of the game is not applying to me. And I don't know why. What mechanic? What mechanic is that? Save ribbons. They don't exist. Welcome, fellas, to a brand new edition of a different type of podcast. Today, we will not be catching innocent little creatures and making them battle for our amusement. No, today, we are the creatures caught in a maze for the amusement of others. My name is Dolan Malna, and with me, I have my buddy Austin. Hello. And my buddy Christian. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, it's been a bit. We're uh, we're we're trying something new, and today, yeah, we're gonna talk about the uh, original release of uh, Resident Evil One. Um, because I told you guys if I had to play another Pokemon game, I was gonna flip out. So <laughs> thankfully, we're switching it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the lead on this one because I know I've got a, a bit more history with this. I did some research, and I thought I'd go over, uh, start a little bit with the history of Resident Evil 1 before we kind of dug in. Um, yeah, so uh, Resident Evil 1 originally was uh, basically going to be a kind of a sequel or a remake to an old SNES horror game called Sweet Home, which ironically was actually like a licensed, uh, you know, video game. Uh, it's crazy, you see like a movie tie-in, um, but it was so well received and so well loved, uh, you know, that we're looking into kind of redoing it, and it kind of over time, there's a longer, more interesting story that we're not all going to get into, but uh, it basically morphed into, you know, the franchise starter that you see today. Uh, another interesting kind of tidbit was for a while, it was intended to be first person. Uh, you know, you look at Doom and things like that, and that really inspired them because it has horror elements, and they thought we'll kind of mimic that. But they weren't able to get the scares to the degree that they wanted. Um, and so they kind of finally landed on not trying to ape action shooters and instead create their own genre, uh, which in this case was survival horror. Um, and we'll get in a little bit lower about what survival horror exactly is. But uh, before that, before I just, you know, yap all your ears off, I kind of wanted to talk first impressions because uh, I've played through this game before. But um, Austin, I know you've played through the remake, but this is your first time playing this version of this game, isn't it? Uh, the classic one, yes, first time playing. Yeah, so I guess I was just uh, going to ask you, first impressions coming back, you've kind of seen the future and you're coming back to the past now. How do you feel about it? Uh, well, in terms of, like, at its core, it feels pretty much very similar to the remake version that I played, so I'm not really taken back about, like, wow, this control scheme is really weird, besides some little <laughs> caveats about the controls being slightly differently mapped compared to the remake one. Um, who puts equip and interact on X, but who does that? <laughs> Do you want to... <laughs> yeah, the Japanese, apparently. Never forgive them. Um, but <laughs> but uh, you want to tell the people at home kind of what is different about the control scheme of both this and the remake in this case? Uh, well, I guess that kind of also depends on which one you're playing and if you enabled a certain thing in case you had to mod in some features to the game to play it. Uh, but I think... Based on what you told me, uh, quick turn is not a thing in the actual game, but it technically is for me. Oh yeah, you've got, we're all playing different, I guess that's worth going over first then, um, before I, we get into all the first impressions, to kind of give an explanation of what the heck's going on with us right now. Yeah, I'm playing uh, basically a slightly modded version of the actual PS1, uh, American PS1 release. All it really is is basically the uh, director's edition with the uh, initial cutscene uh, uncensored, as it all was in all American versions. The Japanese got an uncensored version, and I, I have that kind of basically hacked back in. They added in some other features I'm not really using. Um, uh, but the other thing is it's got the DualShock compatibility without the um, beautiful, beautiful music of the uh, alternate edition that we'll be talking about next time. But that's mine. Uh, I'll just say for you, Austin, because I actually set you up, you're, you're playing basically a uh, hacked version of the Japanese uh, Windows 95 port, I believe, um, specifically with uh, some mods that's like the seamless HD mod and a, a couple other things. I didn't realize when I set you up on this that it was apparently going to have some gameplay changes. I mostly just wanted you to get the classic version in a way that was very easy to, uh, you know, basically run at higher resolutions for video capture. 
without intending to change the gameplay too much, but apparently uh, you, had, you got some cute little quality of life changes that none of us got, so uh, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Christian, you're in fact playing a very special different version, aren't you? You want to tell us about that? Yes, I'm, I'm playing the DS version. So instead of I, I made Christian, I made uh, Austin play a version with higher resolutions, and I guess I made you play the version with even lower resolutions. Um, you're playing yeah. it on a, a calculator, basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that that goes over what you were saying, because uh, to our surprise, Austin, specifically with your version, you're like, where are the ink ribbons? Right? That was a <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find any. Like, wait, I could just save. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. You were like, you just went up to the ty- uh, the typewriter, and you're like, yeah, aren't there supposed to be ink ribbons in these games? Isn't that what they're known for? And I'm like, yeah, here's mine. And you're like, not in mine. And they're like, ooh, quick turn, quick turn. Oh man. <laughs> which is... So yeah, he gets the he gets the perfect I get easy version, mode, which is funny. <sighs> well, thankfully, I did make sure something I intended. Speaking of easy mode, was I made sure none of us got the original uh, American edition, which uh, disabled um, the kind of targeting feature. As we all know, and we'll get into the controls in just a second, as we all know, when you pull your gun, you can tap a button basically to target one of the closest zombies or or switch between targets, which helps a lot in a game that has um, a feature this has, which is fixed camera angles along with tank controls. We'll delve into that in just a second, but it's very important because you can't aim over the shoulder or first person, as they originally intended. They settled on this different control scheme. Um, But in the American version, to up the difficulty to combat uh, rentals, uh, they just, you don't have an auto-targeting system. You have to just know where they are, aim, and pray that you're <laughs> able to hit them. So, because I love you all, I made sure that whatever versions we were playing did not include uh, that crazy feature. But um, I you. guess going from there, yeah, yeah. But that's funny. Well, I, actually, Christian, your take I'm especially interested in, because I've been playing Resident Evil games for, I don't know, probably about a, close to a decade now. And Austin's been a little bit more recent, but he's definitely had a lot of experience with the genre at this point. But this is your first time playing a game like this so you want to tell us kind of how you're feeling about all the the deep end that we kind of threw you into here yeah this is a game uh, <laughs> from so from my experience i've i've played resident evil 4 yeah and part of resident evil 5 so this is my mm-hmm. first experience with one and i'm glad <laughs> that i am I'm glad that I'm playing it now because I can already tell that as a kid, this would have been a game that I would not have continued play. Oh man, so he doesn't like it. Huh? First impression is bad, right? It's it's not that I don't like it. I just I'm just thinking back to like if I had played this around the time that it ca- that it came out or when it was like new. And I don't. I don't yeah, think. Yeah. I don't think I would have continued playing it. Because um. <laughs> it's too scary, right? Oh yes, that's why. That's that's one hundred percent why. <laughs> Watch out for those polygons. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, man. oh man. Okay. Yeah. So what's so different about this one? Yeah, is the the uh, the big claims to fame or whatever is inventing the survival horror genre. A couple things it did was. Um, Rather than, as we mentioned, that first person or over the shoulder camera, it had fixed camera angles, kind of cinematic like a movie. And to navigate that, because it's very difficult, there's something called, and at least in America, it's called tank controls, where your character doesn't really go up relative to the camera, because the camera is frequently shifting outside of your control, but rather forward relative to the position they're facing. And left and right, not moving left and right relative to the camera, but rather tilting your character. Again, very much like you would operate a tank in a video game, where you kind of like have to aim first and then go forward. Um, this style of gameplay is very much fallen out of fashion, um, you know, for quite uh, decades at this point, but, uh, it was actually, believe it or not, if you go back in old reviews, it was actually widely praised for being a very manageable way to, um, navigate the system. Uh, so again, I know I just kind of bullied you, Christian, I'm actually going to bully you again. I kind of want to hear your thoughts. Be honest, talk about what you dislike as a modern perspective. We did that with Pokemon. Let's do that here. Or what you think is valuable or both your impressions of this first type of gameplay where you're having to navigate these wacky camera angles with this uh, unique control style that you're probably not used to. H- how is that as a new experience for you? <laughs> the So, the wacky camera angles and the tank controls were very... It's unlike anything I've ever played. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, 
I'm, I've, I've tried to like think back to if I've ever played anything in this kind of tank controls cinematic fixed camera setting, and I, I don't think I've played anything like this before. So um, a couple, a couple of the games that had at least fixed camera angles were some of the PS1. Um, Final Fantasies, though they didn't opt for tank controls. Uh, a lot of other horror games that you probably haven't touched, and then uh, I guess Silent Hill would be one of the other big ones that you'd see with that kind of control scheme. Okay. Yeah, I I haven't having not played any of those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, brand new to me, and I I can I can appreciate it now um, because it it is new. It's fresh. I definitely can see the the allure that it has especially when it came out because like you said there's not much like this this was new um but the i i've caught myself a couple times getting frustrated with how half a half a step or half a pixel movement will change the camera and i'll end up running into the same wall like six times um, <laughs> or I wish we'd gotten some footage of you. <laughs> oh, I'm glad we don't. <laughs> um, don't worry, I have my own blunders. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's I. I mean, I'm gonna continue. Like, I'm. I'm not. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm not calling. I have you quits. a gunpoint. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but uh, it's. I feel like I've. As I got to basically the end of this round that we've gone through. Uh, of the game, I feel like I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with the controls, so I'm curious. Yeah. And now that I'm kind of getting a feel for for the game, because like in terms of gameplay, and may maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Um, yeah. But when you like collect an collect an item, um, I'm used to just being able to go up to where it goes and just press a button and it say like do you want to use this item but having to go into your bag select the item select use it to then find out if it can't even be used or not uh, <laughs> and like so that that threw me i don't i don't want to spoil any yeah. specific puzzles but uh, i'm sure we'll, we'll talk about them in oh. a minute Oh, yeah, we'll definitely get down to that. Yeah, I think that stems back from those roots as uh, this kind of being started as actually like an RPG style thing. Um, and not that it's it, later games get way better at kind of streamlining some of the things that don't intend, like it tries to keep the difficulty where it's trying to be difficult, but some of the kind of monotony, mm -hmm. uh, it gets a bit better as the series goes on. Um, the rough edges are rough on this one as we'll get back into that, but I do find it fascinating seeing those different styles because before we move on to those puzzles, which I do want to talk about next, uh, Austin, I really did want to hear as someone who has not played these games quite as 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 thoroughly as I have. I know this is a, a semi-new genre for you, but you've had enough time to kind of come to grips and be as comfortable as you're going to be with it. I'm curious how your perspective might have lined up with Christians or where it differs, or what's your take on these controls and camera angle? Uh, so to get the full picture from my perspective, I gotta travel back in time to the very first yeah, time yeah. a Resident <laughs> Evil title has graced a screen of mine, which was Resident <laughs> Evil 4 on the Wii. Uh, now, while it's not the quite same control scheme, it ingrained in my head the concept of Resident Evil camera, bad. And I have gone <laughs> through years and years of my life not wanting to play Resident Evil games because I got experience to a camera angle system that I hated. And I made this very vocal to you when you got me into Resident Evil games for the first time. <laughs> um, Resident Evil 1 Remake, the first one I ever played in this control scheme, was a nightmare to get used to. But at this point, I honestly really love it. It is a control scheme that I would play if a brand new Resident Evil game came out and they went back to tank controls, I would still buy it day one. I enjoy wow. the system at least that much. Wow. Now, did that take... How much time did it take for you to, to go from, like, what the heck is this to, oh, actually, I'm, I'm kind of digging it. What, what was that time frame like for you? Two to three hours within into the remake, I think. It, okay, it clicked see, fairly so that's quickly. Okay. Now, Christian, I don't know how long your exact playtime is, but getting through the mansion takes about 
two to maybe three hours if you're going slow, so it kind of makes sense that maybe a lot of that time was spent. How, how long do you feel getting to the checkpoint we got, which was the guardhouse? Um, how long do you feel like that took you in hours in-game? Um, I mean, two to three hours maybe maybe for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh no. I, I think it took me... I would say at least four. Um, wow. Okay. No. Yeah. Because it's a new. It's a new style to get used to. It's a new style, and I. Yeah. I. <laughs> I got <laughs> lost a few times. I'm so excited to see if this changes, or God forbid, if this is just you slowly being drugged through the mud behind the two of us <laughs> having a blast killing zombies. I hope that's not the case, but it will make for really funny podcasting if yeah. it is, at least. <laughs> oh man. I think it took me two hours exactly looking at the footage I recorded. Yeah, I was close to that. I was actually going to be under two hours slightly, and then um, I got cocky because I have played this a lot, and um, I recalled, I think I mixed it up with the remake in my head, and I felt like I could handle the dogs as you're right as you're going to the guardhouse, and in my version, which had fewer dogs than yours, uh, Austin, because mine, even though it does have the auto-aim added back in, still has the increased enemy count, so there were about six dogs waiting. <laughs> it was three and three, but still, there were like six dogs when I turned the corner, and they just stunlocked me to death, and I was like, ah, I can't even be mad because I did this to myself. So you had three and three? Like, I think mine was two, two, and two. So I think I still had six dogs, but they were spread up in three sections of two. I know enemy placement's a little bit different depending on which version, if you're doing the director's cut or if it's the American or the Japanese. It's basically the same experience, but there's a couple tweaks about it. <laughs> All right, so that's that's enough yapping about this uh, beautiful gameplay that we're dealing with here, but uh, I kind of wanted to go into the other half of this equation. We've been talking a lot about like control schemes and things like that, and I do want to break down some of the puzzles and get more nitty-gritty, but before we get there, I think it's important to establish um, <laughs> the... <laughs> The incredibly frightening, I mean genuinely uh, frightening, terrifying tone that this game sets up, uh, starting with that opening cutscene, right, fellas? Oh, yes. I mean, that's... The dog. Yeah, yes. yeah, what it... I was shaking <laughs> in my slippers. Okay, so, like, we've all seen this. I'm putting it up on the screen now. Um, <laughs> I, I can't hate this, because it does establish very quickly that... The tone of this game, which is is trying to be scary, and I, I, I we can talk about how successful it is at being scary or not, um, but it also is trying to not be miserable. A lot of, actually, Austin, you and I have had a long-standing debate on kind of what qualifies as horror or not, and one of the things you had mentioned was, like, all the horror that you dislike or what you consider an aspect of horror is it kind of being just miserable. Um, and I feel like this game goes out of its way to... It's going to try and be scary. It maybe doesn't succeed, at least not, you know, uh, two decades later. But but it, it also is trying to have some fun on the way. It doesn't want you to be miserable while playing it. And that's pretty evident with that opening cutscene, I feel like. Um, one thing you guys did mention is uh, our versions were slightly different because I got the beautiful, uh, I got the beautiful, I got a shotgun with some lyrics at the beginning of, of my version. I don't know if that was hacked in or what exactly I did wrong, um, but it, it, I have been giggling about that ever since. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that opening's pretty cheesy. Mine's a little bit more intimidating. And in fact, I'll, I'll show... I wonder if YouTube will let me. I may or may not be showing um, the version up there that's kind of the uncensored violence, uh, where it's in color and you get like more kind of gore from what the dogs are doing and not just the camera shaking wildly. Uh, it's a little bit more spooky and I think is a better representative of what the game's trying to be, where it's a little bit corny, a little bit goofy, having a little bit of fun, but is trying to actually sh juxtapose that with genuinely scary moments. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Austin, I'll bully you first on that. How effective do you think, not later games, but this game right here, the PS1, is at being scary, at having atmosphere? What do you think? Uh, hmm. Well, this is, from my perspective, I have maybe 5% of a horror feel for this game. It's not <laughs> scary in really any capacity, in my opinion. It is very goofy and campy, um, but I have a really hard time personally getting scared from, like, it, again, it's a really, it, the game came out a while ago, but the low-poly <laughs> zombies 
are not scary. Uh, the atmosphere is fun to be in, but I don't, I'm not scared around the area. Like, turning a corner, camera changes, and there's two zombies, it's like, oh, hi. It's not like, ah, <laughs> zombie! It's just like, time for you to die yeah. now. So, I'm not yeah, scared in the slightest. Yeah, that scene's come off a little bit. Just for reference, since this is 5% scary, what percent scary is Pokemon Yellow? Negative 20? Negative 20. Okay, so we're at least beating that. Christian, I think one of the antidotes to fear is frustration. So, <laughs> I have a feeling I already know what you're going to say, but I got to ask you too. Um, you know, even years later, uh, is this horror game, does it still hold any power of terror for you? I... I am not scared by it, but... <laughs> but you fear it. <laughs> I... <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I will say this. In terms of, like, the vibe that this game has, especially with the, like, live-action cutscenes, <laughs> that I love. I love that. <laughs> um, you love the Goofy Camp. <laughs> it, gave, it gave so much of a like 80s 90s campy horror film fe uh, yeah. feel to it like mm -hmm. that <laughs> that is worth the gameplay issues for me honestly <laughs> that is at least so far that has been the saving grace of this game because um, it I just I love that that feel and that vibe to it <laughs> Um, well, oh, go on. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that that vibe goes on beyond just the intro because while that is the the height <laughs> of the camp, um, those in-game cutscenes I don't think really uh, remove that that camp and that goofiness very much, do they, fellas? No, 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 no. Not the, at all. The best <laughs> joy of the campiness are the voice acting throughout the entire game. The top tier no game has better voice acting than this game <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you guys you guys played through the jill campaign uh or as i played through chris which means you guys got to experience the wonder that is resident evil one barry burton um which is just just a delight uh i, I mean how how often have y'all caught me uh, just quoting stuff he says. At least Austin, I know you catch me. <laughs> it's forest. Oh my god! <laughs> it's great. And of course, there's the ever, the ever, uh, you know, ever memeable. Uh, you were almost a Jill sandwich, master of unlocking. Uh, <laughs> this gun. I have this. It's especially useful against living things. I mean, just. Every cutscene, he says something utterly bizarre, and you're just like, "What the heck?" I keep half thinking he's like gonna turn. Every even though I've played the game, I keep waiting for him to turn out to be like a monster that's trying to pretend to be a human. That's how bizarre Barry Burton is in Resident <laughs> Evil One. On that note, um, it sounds like mm -hmm. Jill's response is that she's just acting like she's in a sitcom. <laughs> Barry, oh, Barry! You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I keep waiting for the laugh track. It's it, <laughs> so. <laughs> I do agree. I think at this point, it is really fun, but I don't know how scary it is, and where it's scary, it's almost kind of um, an accident. While I do think the bear, the bones of what it was setting out, would lay the ground for genuinely great horror games, um, that could do things scary. Uh, for instance, we'll get into that in a minute, but the ink ribbon system I think is a brilliant idea for games that are trying to induce horror. I, I feel like while those building blocks are there, the uh, execution is just a little too janky that it isn't especially scary, at least nowadays. Maybe we're just desensitized by what's available now and what we've seen the series go, but I think, I think we are of a consensus that while the atmosphere is fun, it's not too spooky. Uh, I'll give one brief exception. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all read, I know you have to pass by, but actually read The Keeper Diary. Um, uh, uh, Christian, did you read The Keeper Diary? I believe so. If it's That's the, the one itchy, that I'm tasty. Thinking. Oh, yes. Yeah, the itchy. Yeah, Austin, you, you, you know of The Keeper Diary if you didn't read it, right? The Itchy Tasty Diary. 
Uh, yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, the one you're referring yeah. to, yes. Yeah, I do feel that is one moment. Ironically, it's probably because it's stripped back where you're you're just reading text. It's not having to listen to voice acting or or trying to show you a low poly zombie. Um, it it is. I think it settles home what maybe the series should have gone for a little bit more, at least at this stage, um, where you start thinking about the conceptual horror, because the little Minecraft zombie chasing you isn't that scary. But thinking about a man slowly losing his sense of self and slowly succumbing to this virus and being turned into a a husk of a human being, that's actually a little spooky. That is actually scary if you stop and think about it. Maybe we're too ADHD brain to really stop and think about the implications, but there's a another message later in the game where a man's like, yeah, I've been infected and I've taken some stuff to try and slow it, but I know that's just buying me time and it's just enough time to write my wife, you know, you, my wife, this letter before I blow my brains out because I can't stand the thought of becoming one of these monsters. And I feel that's the most effective sense of horror that this game has uh, over, you know, the actual danger to your character or the music, which I do think is fantastic kind of electro synth uh, soundtrack that really fits the mood of that 80s horror vibe. But I think the most effective moments are those personal letters of these men who realize that they're going to die and not just die, but die a gruesome, horrible death and that their corpses are going to be puppeted by this thing afterwards and and the implications of that i i think it i'll give it a point there maybe you two won't but i i think it gets a point there uh you know gold star resident evil (laughs) one but uh i guess if if we've gone through that that's worth enough we can kind of finally uh break down a little bit into some of the specifics about survival horror that i promised we were going to talk about earlier that sound good to you guys yeah yeah sounds good okay fantastic so I kind of baited this earlier with what is survival horror? There's a bunch of different kind of conflicting definitions, and I'd actually be interested to hear uh, what you guys think after this, but I'm going to give what I kind of landed on as I I think survival horror is. Um, I kind of think it's three main points with two kind of implied points. Um, Those uh, three main points are that you have limited control of your character. Um, That two is that inventory management is a very big point part of your experience. And the third is kind of what I call balance of power, which means that there are going to be severe moments where you're outmatched and don't have enough firepower to kill everything, you know, a la something like Doom, but that you still, if you're competent enough, can get these moments of catharsis where you've saved up enough ammo that you can kind of go gung-ho, at least for a little bit. Um, And then the two subpoints are kind of to the inventory management is that map design has to facilitate inventory management, what that by that what that I mean is it's not enough to go you have limited inventory the map needs to facilitate that you have to use a bunch of different things and make decisions about that I bring up a point in my Resident Evil 2 video that technically speaking Halo has limited inventory but I don't think that makes it part of a survival horror game because the map design doesn't facilitate needing more than two slots to have two different guns and the last sub point is since it's survival horror the game should at least try and be spooky um, whether it succeeds or not is kind of you know whatever but it should at least be going for a spooky aesthetic uh i know that's a lot of rambly words but that's kind of what i think of when i think of what a survival horror game is i spent the time to write it down beforehand so i know i have an advantage but uh austin what do you think of that definition would you add anything take it away do you have any strong feelings about the word survival horror uh so i don't really have any issues with any of the like how it was defined from your perspective i probably will condense some things because i feel like two of your points are almost practically one and the same um, oh, which ones are that? Like <laughs> inventory management and then balance, your balance of power. I feel like that's just mm-hmm. in, like just resource management in general. Well, uh, which is how uh, I just uh, describe it as just in two parts of survival horror is spooky aesthetic resource management game. Pretty the reason I, I think it's it. mild. The reason I have those two as separate is because I would view something like Amnesia or Outlast as not true survival horror. Because you do have inventory management where you're managing multiple items, but there's no form of combat. There's no catharsis where after you hide for a bit, you can manage your resources in a way that allows you to kind of um, also go on the offensive once in a while. And I felt at least that was an important... And you, you could disagree, but the reason I had those separate is I feel like if your game doesn't have combat, it's not really survival horror. It's more of a like hiding simulator game. And I thought that was enough to distinguish it intentionally. Yeah, fair enough. So having combat specifically, yes, that works. It's, I yeah. can't express how much I hate horror games 
that are just, as you said, hiding simulators where you have no yeah. ability to I fight back. But that also yeah. is one of the few things that actually triggers like fear in me playing a horror game is being defenseless. But it's not fun. Interesting. I hate so, it. That's a much bigger conversation that I guess we'll get into a little bit. But I, I mildly disagree. I'm not saying you're not allowed to feel scared. For me, it triggers the opposite reaction because if I have to make a decision on am I doing combat or not, how am I going to spend my resources, that's much more tension building. That's m the kind of thing that, in a good way, in a fun way, stresses me out and makes me care and invest. And I'm like, oh, I got to do this right. Because if I know the only option is to run faster or sit and wait in a corner, it just utterly kills my kind of investment in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay because I know it, the spooky monsters don't matter. I'm either going to be able to run fast enough or I just have to sit here and yawn until it's done. But if I have to think, crap, there are five zombies, I'm on low health, I've got three shotgun shells between me and that herb. Do I fight? How many do I fight? How do I negotiate that? That kind of calculus running constantly in my head is what brings more tension to me, um, personally, on that one, at least. And I get that, and just kind of continuing <laughs> that line of thought, like, tension and suspense in moments like that, trying to decide, well, do I fight or do I do something else? That's, that. I still get that, but that's not what fear is to me. That doesn't give me, like, a fear hmm. feeling as, like, being defenseless against something that I can't do. Like, something coming at me that I can literally do nothing about. That's more of a fear rather than suspense. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we go through. Uh, Christian, I guess two questions related to that. One, what do you think about these definitions of kind of survival horror? And two, I guess have you played other horror games that maybe aren't survival horror that you feel this is a different genre? Or does it all kind of blend together and it's like, it's just a spooky game, you guys are overthinking it. What's your take on this? I mean, I, I think you both have very valid definitions with regards to suspense and fear and horror and what what exactly all of that means i mean i thinking back i don't know if i really i don't have much experience in like playing survival horror really at all um well what about other horror um i can think of one example i know you've played is the uh, scarecrow sections of arkham asylum yeah i i guess that I mean that. I mean that for me never really invoked any kind of a fear. Um, <laughs> They're supposed to be spooky, at least though. Uh, they they do have a spooky vibe. Like th they have the spooky, spooky music and like. I mean, I I guess in that sense, yeah, that was, like you could tell it it had a spooky vibe to it, but it wasn't like, I wasn't like clutching my controller, shaking in a cold sweat. Um, <laughs> Which apparently that's my definition of fear. <laughs> so you're finding that out now. Yeah, live on the podcast. I'm learning so much about myself. What a self discovery <laughs> we have here. Um, <laughs> but I think, I, th I think in terms of what what you guys were saying, you both make very valid points. I, I feel like I kind of agree with both of you. Like, it's the option. There's this suspense and tension with having the option to fight, but also like, but then again, I don't know what's around the next corner, so maybe I shouldn't fight here and try to save it, um, because resources are so limited. And then there's also the tension of, oh, the example you gave, there's five zombies, I have three shells, and there's a green herb. Do you have enough space in your bag for an herb? Like, that's, that's other mm -hmm. tension, because you can't... It, at least in this game, you can't just use it as, as you pick it up. It has to go into your bag first. Um, so yeah, but I I also understand what Austin's saying with the being defenseless, having having no way to fight, and your option B only hide or run. Um, I I can understand where he's coming from too. So I mean, hmm. I think yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> no, that's allowed. I think that's, yeah, I think that we've hit that. It's going to be interesting. I wanted to make sure we got our perspectives out for people who are listening to kind of understand how we think about this. And as we go forward, our different kind of mentalities 
Uh, so I think that'll be fun. Um, I did want to toss on to when we were talking about the gameplay and kind of what makes something horror, survival horror. One thing I think this game does really effectively that many other games don't do, and I, I understand why because it is scary, is make saves a collectible item, a real physical resource. That's kind of a ballsy move, I feel, on this game's part. And I know, mm -hmm. Austin, you've got the super special edition where you don't have to deal with that like us peasants. But Christian and I, when we want to save, we got to think about it. It's not like, I'm going to run back and save because I just did, you know, killed one zombie and run back. It's like, I have this many ink ribbons, and I really need to think about when I'm going to save. Um, I think that's a clever thing that puts you in the same brain space as the character. Because, you know, your character, obviously, if this is a real person, is scared to die. They don't want to, they want to avoid enemies, they want to avoid damage because they don't want to die. And you as the player, I think this is a big disconnect, don't really care if you die. Especially if, like, you get more knowledge. You know, I, in a lot of these games that I was even mentioning, uh, Amnesia, I don't care about dying. In fact, dying is useful. One of my main strategies in going through the game, like Amnesia, is to run forward, hit a checkpoint, intentionally die as a way to more quickly remove enemies, because if you reload from a checkpoint, the enemies despawn, and then keep moving forward. So I'm in a very different, desynchronous um, headspace from my character, who my character clearly doesn't want to die, because they don't come back from that, but me as the player, I don't care. So what the character finds scary and what I find scary are not in alignment, but I tend to think with these limited saves, I'm more likely to be in alignment with my character because, yeah, if I die, you know, obviously I'm not losing my life, but I'm losing, in my case I did, an hour of progress, which, uh, in as an adult with children, an hour is very precious to me. So, <laughs> like, there's, there's real stakes there for me where I'm like, oh no, I can't die, I don't have time to do this again. So... Uh, I, I think that's a very effective thing the game does. I don't know if either of y'all really have an opinion well, on that, but that's I do, uh, worth actually, signing. to yeah. comment, comment yeah. on that. So, I guess there's kind of like two different ways I guess you can probably view having saves a collectible item. I can see, like, from just kind of looking at it from the certain way that it really does kind of more immerse you into that feeling mm -hmm. of the character, which... It, you're just kind of going back to your example, like, hey, I'm an adult, I have all these obligations, I have limited time to play the game. Instead of feeling, like, really into it, a positive feel about what this game is giving to me, dying and losing progress kind of just gets <laughs> annoying instead. So it's like, it kind of depends on your mindset when you go into the game. If you're there just to vibe, it's a fantastic idea. If your goal is to try to clear it in limited timetables, it sucks. It really sucks. Well, but I have a question for you, because did, did you die at all during your playthrough, Austin? No. Okay, well, I, I did, and this is why I think that fear may be overblown because you didn't die, so you're imagining that's going to be worse than it is. For me, um, dying and losing that progress actually, even though I talked about losing an hour, I'm kind of exaggerating, because I think the most important thing about this game is knowledge more than anything. You can clear things, like, hilariously fast if you know exactly what to do. And yeah, you gotta dust off the cobwebs, even for me who's played this a lot of times, but when I died, I lost an hour of wandering, and I was able to redo that in like 20 minutes of intentionality, being able to go exactly to my targets in the order I wanted, now that I remembered the best way to do everything. So I, I think it kind of had, it gets, I think it gets to have its cake and eat it too, where it gives you the fear of thinking, I'm going to lose an hour of progress, holy crap. But then the keep its cake too is that usually your second go through doing the same stuff, it's not actually an hour. It's it's more, it's like half the time or less in my opinion. So that's been my experience. But actually, Christian, you may be more uh, able to speak on this recently because you probably died more than once based on our conversations. Yes. Did you feel after you died, were you able to accomplish the same tasks faster than the first time and get better at them? Or did you really lose that much time and it was really achingly frustrating to have those limited saves? Yes. <laughs> the second? <laughs> I would say yes to both. I, I felt like I learned from it, um, but also I it would frustrate me because I'm the I'm the kind of person that, especially in a game like this, where they're like in a game like this, I'm the kind of person that clears a room, runs back and saves, clears the next room, runs back and saves. Um, 
so that I don't have to like keep redoing stuff over and over again. Yeah. And I couldn't do that here. Yeah, um, this game does not. That's exactly what the save ribbons are intended to stop it, from happening. It worked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, tr I basically was just really intentional about like, I'll clear a section. And then I'll feel like I, I'll have covered enough space that I don't want to go and redo that whole thing, but I've cleared that section and naturally made it back to the save point. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I did. Um, How frustrating was that for you? First learning when I did, before I figured many things out, it was very frustrating. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how. I didn't know I had to equip my gun um, <laughs> when I first started the game because I just assumed in the cutscenes, you know, they they have guns. You you think they got she, a shotgun? Yeah. <laughs> you would you would think she already had her gun ready, but no, um, clearly not. And the knife is the knife. The knife less than useless. It is the equivalent of trying to use a butter knife to cut through a wooden table. <laughs> that that is the best way I can describe it. If any yeah, listener I... has tried to cut through a wooden table with a butter knife, just please t let us know how successful you were. Is that how successful you were with your knife? Yes. Okay, because <laughs> I, I, the first zombie killed me twice. Oh no! Before I, <laughs> you didn't run from him. I did. I thought I had to. I thought I had to get something behind him because I'm not used to this style of game. Interesting. So I thought I had to fight him. There is ammo if you if you do kill him and then examine the body. You do get ammo as a reward for doing that, but it's not necessary. Yeah, but like I I didn't know that. So <laughs> that's that's why I finally reached out to you guys, and you were like, "Oh, you have to equip the gun." So then I, I used ammo to kill him. Um, yeah. And found out there wasn't really anything behind him, but I I, yeah. I felt like I, just from my experience with with other games, not in this genre, not this style of game, I just assumed there's an enemy I have to get. I have to. Yeah. Def wipe out the enemy and get to whatever wherever they were because there's probably something there um yeah that's how my yeah. mind so, works to kind of this go off that does question on the... quick, um yeah i found in to find it interesting how we both kind of started this game a bit differently so it kind of seems like to me that you got into the game and you just started rolling with it and you try to hopefully get a grasp of the controls as you go is that kind of how you did that? Or did you try to go through a control list first, like kind of what I did? I just tried to see like, okay, how do I move? How do I aim? How do I do this? And I did make sure I did all that before I left the dining room. So I'm kind of curious what went through your mind when you first started. I I just kind of rolled with it because <laughs> at least a lot of games today or like that that I played through like my childhood and up, up to this point, when you first start them have like some sort of a tutorial level or as you're going they have like the quick tips of like press x to open a door like things like that um so i just kind of assumed there would be something like that here so i i'm not the kind of person that look like looks at controls and figures stuff out first i just kind of go head on assuming that the game's going to tell me what i need to know um and clearly my assumptions were wrong here <laughs> I guess I should have sent the manual over because I, I, you know, back in the 90s, you would have been assumed to have read the manual before jumping into the game, which, you know, we don't really do anymore because we don't get manuals anymore. Did anyone yeah. ever read the manual before starting a game? I know this is oh, right yeah, Oh, yeah. No, back, back in when I was a kid, yeah. Really? Yeah, that was very common. No, so, okay, side, side tangent, which everyone's here for anyway. If you're listening to the Silly Podcast, you exist for side tangents. But, um, like, old RPGs, for instance, literally, uh, Final Fantasy IV, one of the first RPGs I got, the manual literally is a walkthrough through the first half of the game. Like, they're so, like, we know you don't get this, 
and you're a child, here is a walkthrough. It's not just like they would like, I don't know what the Resident Evil 1 manual looks like because I ended up, I actually haven't read it, but like they might literally solve the first puzzle for you even just to be like, we want to make sure you kind of get it before you go in. That was the level of detail manuals used to have back in the day. Wow. I, I Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have I have a small collection of PS1 and PS2 games that I'm now kind of want to go back and look at the manuals in there and see what they look like because I don't remember that ever would... looking at manuals prior to starting a game. Oh man, we maybe we should do a side episode on manuals sometime. That's a little <laughs> bit of a sidetrack, but yeah. So that's yeah. <clears throat> I guess dealing with that. Uh, I guess talking about you know whether you should have run or not. I think one of the interesting things about this is kind of this Metroidvania as setup that this game has. You know, where we're we're. You've got these left and right wings and different keys blocking everything. Uh, how did you guys, I guess I'll bug Austin. What do you think about, you've played these games before, but what do you think about kind of the puzzle-esque setup where you have a big lot of options to go through, but you're going to have to narrow them down one at a time, that Metroidvania setup? Uh, so, I mean, I, I never attributed it to Metroidvania because I never played any hmm. Metroid games or anything oh, like oh, that where that oh, genre is wow. defined. We'll have to fix that. But um, <laughs> what Resident Evil displays in terms of its map layout puzzles and progression through those puzzles is very endearing to me. I really like <laughs> uh, that method of map progression. It's very fun. Um, yeah. I enjoy it. You're going to have fun when we get to Castlevania. Uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's a lot of similar ideas, even if it's in a 2D space. Uh, Christian... We were just talking about how difficult it was. You're having to not just solve these puzzles, but you come to grips with a new control scheme, learn all these hidden rules that feel like second nature to those who have played before. Were you able to even enjoy any of the puzzles, or was it like just at this point, it is another frustration on top of a bunch of other crap I'm trying to figure out right now? I, I enjoyed the puzzles once I kind of got a feel for the controls. Um, yeah. But before I figured out the controls, the puzzles were more frustrating than anything else. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um... Uh, oh. I have to ask. Yes. Did you get tricked by the poison room? The one with the gas? Yeah. Yes. It gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I... You see a button on the floor, and there's a statue you can move. Naturally... <laughs> With how games are today, <laughs> you put a statue on top of the button. How did that go? I had to redo a few things. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say right before I went in. Oh, Christian, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you can't yeah, get I... out once it once the gas starts, so you're stuck in there. Uh, you, you can if you push the um because how you're supposed to avoid that is you know push the um statues over the gas if you push the statues over it unlocks it and you can get out i believe my predicament was i so i pushed both the statues together on top <gasps> of the button oh so you couldn't get them you had <laughs> i couldn't them. move i they were stuck <laughs> i couldn't move the statues anymore <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry, Christian. <laughs> so I'm this literally just running around this room, filling with gas, trying to figure <laughs> oh, out, that's... do I need to shoot something? <gasps> what did I miss? <laughs> I'm an idiot. I'm dead. <laughs> I kind of get so that, because you're not used to the way Resident Evil does puzzles yet. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm just in the mindset, as soon as I walk into a room, even on a new game, I'm just thinking... All right, what in here is going to kill me? How do I stop it? <laughs> and that's just what I do. Treat every single room. <laughs> I'll get there, I'm sure. Oh, man. This is funny. I'm waiting to see Krishna at the end of this, like, you know, just dual fisting, like, shotguns and be like, not a problem. I already <laughs> have enough save ribbons. I just did it through without saving. I'm that good. I got a shotgun. Uh, I believe I got a shotgun. Is that going to be our dicklet for this? Oh, no. <laughs> this our yes. Dicklet? Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, I do. I also really enjoy the puzzles. Um, they're... <clears throat> they're... A couple of things I love about them. One is the most difficult part is figuring them out. Once you've done it and you want to go back through a speed run, they're not a lot of, like, really frustrating kind of, like, logarithmic, you know, mathematical equations. It's like... 
once you get it, you can run back through them quickly. That's one of the greatest things about this game that we'll get to later. I don't know if I'll be able to convince you to go through a second through, a second playthrough, but the first playthrough is very slow, methodical, lots of confusion and, and difficulties, and then the second one it plays like an action game. That's kind of the beauty of these classic games, but I, I do love the puzzles that are interesting enough to kind of get you thinking. Um, but uh, uh, they're quick enough that once you know the solution, you can kind of just force through them without really having to slow down. I think another puzzle worth special mention that um, Austin, you and I actually had some difficulty on, and I'm, I, I think we talked to Christian about this off air, but I'd love to get it on air, is the, um, the uh, picture, kind of the picture painting puzzle where you get to the end. <clears throat> there's this area with a bunch of crows, and there's a picture at the end that says, like, Please, I long for death, give me death. And there's a bunch of pictures of different ages of, of uh, a man and what you're supposed to do with that. Uh, uh, Christian, what was your reaction? I, I, I want to hear unfiltered first how you handled that puzzle because Austin and I had kind of some differing opinions on it. My first thought mm -hmm. was how did these crows get inside this house? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a, good, that's, a good, that's a good thing to ask. And then... My second thought was, I'm just going to push all the buttons and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> he is not first in the ways of Resident Evil yet. My third th thought was, those crows killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do it again. And then my fourth thought was, let's go... They're all different ages, so let's go youngest to oldest and then see if that works. Okay. Uh, so, did you not feel like the hint at the end was um, helpful enough to know to go youngest to oldest on that? After after doing the first round of just pushing the buttons, and I, like, as I pushed the buttons, I read everything, but I wasn't sure how to undo what I had already did. So I was like, yeah. I'm committed. Let's just push them all. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe this is what they want me to do. Um, the crows disagreed. But um, <laughs> if if I had taken the time and, and just read everything and not pressed buttons first, I feel like I would have gotten to the conclusion of, yeah, just go infant. Uh, I guess it was, I think it was newborn to infant uh, mm -hmm. to young yeah, boy, young man. Yeah, yeah uh, all the way to death and then <laughs> receive my, my reward. <laughs> So that's, yeah, that's what because <laughs> uh, Austin felt it was very intuitive, and this isn't his um, uh, props to you. I guess you explain, but I want to give you extra credit. You did this isn't you just remembering the solution. That puzzle is not in the remake, so you really did just walk in and felt like it was pretty intuitive, right? Yeah. So my experience when I walked into the room was I'm like, okay, well, uh, this is obviously going to be a puzzle room because I remember in at least a remake it was a puzzle in that area, even mm -hmm. though it's drastically different. So I walked up to the first painting and inspected it, and I saw, like, shows a band, blah, blah, blah. There's a button. Do you want to press it? And I'm thinking, I'm not pressing anything until I know what this room's about. So I didn't touch the <laughs> button. I walked to the end at that point and saw the um, picture saying, like, oh, unto death. And I looked at one more picture, and it was a different age. I'm like, oh, okay, that's just youngest to oldest. Boop, 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 done. Yeah. I actually even messed it up myself, um, even though I'd played it before and I remembered it. Uh, but when it said, give me your unto death, I was like, oh, he wants the old man closest to death. So I only pressed that button and then the crows disagreed, as Christian said. But um, I was pretty sure I was wrong and I was mostly just trying to see what would happen. But I, I find it interesting that each of us had a different reaction <laughs> to the stupid puzzle. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think that's fun. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them are, but that's the kind of thing, like I was mentioning earlier, once you know the answer, you know the answer. You're not going to have to think about that again too hard on a repeat playthrough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it does stop and make you think and kind of rack your brain, and they're not so easy that we all, for Austin, I guess, who's the super genius among us, he just walked in and solved it. But for no, I'm not two of us, genius. one of us, one of us who even had played the game before, um, actually got it wrong on the first try. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that's an interesting kind of view on the puzzles there okay i know we're getting near the end but i kind of wanted to go over because you know I, this isn't exactly a walkthrough but i thought it'd be worth talking about some of those crazy moments that happened in the story for us and kind of some of the big differences we got because the game starts out you know 
you're playing as one of your characters, the other one goes missing, hey, let's go find that guy. And then pretty soon you're separated and you'll meet your companion, again, Barry if you're Jill, and Claire if you're Chris, and try mm -hmm. and uh, find them. Claire. Are there any... I'm sorry, I said Claire and what I meant was Rebecca. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, I'm a dumbass, so we're just going to go from there. <laughs> no, Claire is not in this game, but Rebecca is. Uh, and there's just some... I kind of wanted to go over some of the big moments that well, I, I want to hear. I know we kind of talked briefly, but uh, Austin, I mean, tell me about Barry, please. Barry is a wonderful, even if he's a bit sus, uh, man that is wandering <laughs> this, uh, this... Why did I forget the word? Mansion, yes, it's a mansion. mansion yeah, yeah, I'm clearly the smart one. I don't know what a mansion is. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, he, he sure is okay. weird, but he sure is funny. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Christian, you have any strong opinions about Barry? Something's off about that man. <laughs> what, what do you think's off about him? Just like the weird like d dialogue or like like script character wise, you think there's something off about him? So it, I have two theories. Okay. My first theory is either he's up to something and he's some sort of sneaky uh, behind the backs guy. Um, my second thought is he is scared and He's scared. and weird. <laughs> he like there's one situation where he's like, "We should split up. I'll go back in the room we were just in. <laughs> you go to that entirely new wing of the of the manor." And I'm I'm like this. It's he's he's like I don't know he he's bad at coming up with plans he's like the wish version of Freddy from Scooby Doo like or not even he did wish. save your life when you grabbed the shotgun yeah but I mean why was he there he was supposed to be in the oh. dining room you know and okay. I don't know. He, he's something. Something's not right about him. I don't know what because uh, I haven't played this before. But <laughs> Barry so has me weary. Okay, yeah, weary on Barry. I like it. Now I will. I don't know if this helps or hurts your theory. Part of you. I'm not going to confirm nor deny the plot implications. I will say there's very likely some gameplay limitations because one of my favorite moments on the Chris playthrough where you meet Rebecca you meet Rebecca and she's like oh I, I'm like one of the last surviving members of that team we went to come look for you know and she's like <laughs> she, she's like all right I finally met another survivor thank god can can I join you on your team and you can say yes or no and I'm like yeah let's get some help so I hit yes and she's like thank goodness I'll stay here while you go on a <laughs> <laughs> When you say yes, come help me out, she's like, I'm going to help you out by staying here. <laughs> which which is, <laughs> I'm sure it makes a change, because I don't know if you've noticed, or we've talked about it a little bit, but there's a bunch of little story cutscene changes depending on your actions. Um, oh, you know what, that leads right into the next one. Uh, when you meet Yawn, everyone had, I guess, a slightly different thing. I found a corpse when I went to go, Yawn is the giant snake, by the way, I should have mentioned that, but outside the oh, giant okay. snake room, I met a corpse. There was no one there for me uh just yeah no he was there but like he was dead uh and i happen to know i can pretend like why is that but i happen to know i just took too long to get to him and there's an internal clock you know like timer and i think if you take more than 30 minutes from starting the game to get to him or maybe it's an hour i don't remember um he just dies and doesn't have a cutscene. it is unfortunate because austin you got to witness greatness when you met him alive did you not yes uh, as he ushered to me in some of his dying words there are terrible demons. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. But see, what's even funnier is Christian, you found him alive, right? Yes. But he sounds nothing like that, did he? That impression is not a thing you've heard before, is it? His... It sounded like someone was reading off a teleprompter. <laughs> um, okay. Uh -huh. It's just, there are terrible demons. Ah... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh. 
So it's even better is like you can almost forgive the Resident Evil 1 game because again it's a Japanese game. They're, they've even admitted that they like didn't have the funds to hire professional actors or anything like that. They just literally grabbed people off the street who could speak English. Not even well, you know, sometimes. They weren't even always native English speakers. And it was like, can you speak English and you don't sound Japanese? Okay, you're in our game. Some of them are like Canadian or like Belgian, I think. Like, I don't even know all the details. They don't even know who all of them are. Uh, they haven't been able to hunt them all down. Um, but what's even sadder is they, they added in kind of a CPR minigame in the, in the extra mode that I made you not play, Christian. And it required extra dialogue from uh, that character whose name I'm forgetting right now. Uh, Richard, Richard. Anyway. And so they replaced him, you know, in that version so that he could have extra dialogue and things like that for that. But in, they just decided to leave him as the main voice in the thing. So that means that the bad voice acting in your version isn't from 1998 or whatever. It's from like 2007 or whenever the remake came out. And it still sounds like that. That's even worse. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> We had had Res Resident Evil 4 had come out by the time that that game came out, and we were still <laughs> like that was the voice acting they went with. I don't know if they were trying to make it fit in by being bad or what, but it's a it's a it's a treat. But yeah, we fought that giant snake, and that leads to one of the other kind of alternate you know takes. Uh, did any of y'all get bit? Did we all get bit by the snake? Uh, Austin, did you get bit? Uh, I did, and it's kind of funny because I started doing the snake shortly into my second time playing the game because I played it in two batches uh, to get to yeah. our checkpoint. And uh, I didn't remember what the controls were when I started. I forgot that like X and all these other things did things or how to aim my gun. So I waltzed in and like, let's fight, Snake! And I'm like, what? why am I not aiming? Why can't I shoot? Oh no! And then it bit me. <laughs> <laughs> and then but you I, made I it out alive in the end, right? Yeah, I made it alive and killed it, but it, it, it did not go as well as I hoped it would go. <laughs> Uh, did you kill it or did it run off? Yeah, well, it ran off. Yeah, it's not dead, dead. Okay, but yeah. I defeated I the snake sure. and it left. Yeah. See, I just avoided it. Like, I got bit, but I just didn't even engage with it. I just ran and grabbed the item and ran back out. <laughs> what about you, Christian? See, again, I didn't know that was an option. I didn't think you could run back out. I thought I had you to. Can. I, I ran and got the item and then I kept circling the room with my bazooka and I used all my bazooka ammo on him. Uh, um, I, I'm going to be specific. It's your grenade launcher because there is a missile bazooka launcher later in the game. It's a different thing. Okay. Um, yeah. Grenade launcher. I used yeah. I used all of that my ammo on that on him, uh, but he did bite me. <laughs> and so we all got the scene where you walk out. It's like, oh no, I am yeah. poisoned. <laughs> mm -hmm. What happened? What happened for you guys? I woke up in the room where the serum was at that I had to get for Richard um, initially, mm -hmm. and uh, was like, oh, I'm awake now. And then I just kept playing. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, when you're playing as Chris, um, well, first off, I didn't get Richard a serum because uh, the, well, you know, he was just dead. dead. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you play as Chris, he walks up and goes, oh, I have a terrible headache. And Rebecca shows back up and is like, oh, no! Don't worry, I'll protect you. And then you have to run to the other side of the mansion where the serum is, grab it and come back to where Chris is. And if you've planned ahead and you've wiped out a pretty good path, that's actually not that hard. You just walk there and walk back. If you happen to have not made a safe path there, you are playing as Rebecca with no access to any of your item boxes, one pistol and 15 bullets to your name. Hope you make it. <laughs> so, yeah. I happen to know, of course, that it's coming and prepared accordingly, but yeah, that's another one of those kind of beginner's traps that if you're not careful about. Chris's game in general is harder than Jill's. He's got fewer item slots um, and a couple moments where he, he really does kind of get like, all right, here's the harder version of this. So, But mm -hmm. I played the game enough. It wasn't that big a deal. All right. Thinking about wrapping up, are there any other big topics before we kind of hit the final sections that you guys want to talk to? Anything I glanced over or missed in our conversation? Uh not that I can think of, and there's not really a lot of what about, uh, big moments other yeah. than me getting lost at one point because of the blue <laughs> gem puzzle that I had. It, they actually remake screwed me over slightly in that one because I thought, oh, I need two gems to accomplish this, and I just walked around with the one gem and didn't realize, oh, <laughs> I just need to walk there with the one gem and spent a good 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. 
<laughs> that's not just remake, that's another one of those kind of poor in execution, because it does tell you you need these two gems to get the solution, and you do need them to get the final prize, but you can use just one to get the progression item, so I, I agree, that's not greatly conveyed. Uh, did we just tell you what to do on that one, Christian, at that point, because you were having a frustrated time, or did you figure that one out? You guys told me, and I'm so glad that I'm not the only one that had that issue, because it literally <laughs> says, it looks like a red gem and a blue gem would fit, so I assumed, just like you did, Austin, you had to go find the red gem, or else <laughs> you couldn't do anything. Yeah. So I yeah. I could have gotten it, like, I went and got, like, three other things before I came back and realized I could have gotten it at the beginning of the game. Um, that was the last thing I got. <laughs> me too. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so some of the puzzles aren't greatly conveyed. It's the first game. I am willing to give them a little bit of a pass, but, yeah, that definitely gets improved. I'm so excited to come back to Remake and have... Uh, you've played it before, Austin, but Christian go like, oh, it's like the game, but not frustrating, I'm hoping, is how his reaction <laughs> is to it. <laughs> in some way. In some it's, There are <laughs> some changes. I mean, yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, I'm so excited. But yeah, all right. Some of this we talked about. Let's just let's just hit these bullet points real quick as we kind of wrap up on this one. I think the first question is: Is it still scary? Because it really was considered scary back in the day. I think we kind of answered this before. Are we all in agreement? That's a no, Austin. It's a no for me, dog. Yeah, Christian, is it scary? It's gonna be a no. Yeah, for me, the only thing scary is how much fun I'm having with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but after that, I think the next question is, is it still fun, Christian? Yes. Answer honestly. <laughs> Don't lie to me, boy. I can see fun somewhere. Let the hate the cut scenes are fun. you. <laughs> Yeah, but that's a small percentage of the playtime. I don't think, if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I do not get the impression you're having fun yet. I, not necessarily. I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm having a ton of fun yet. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, she could have reached the thing off the shelf, and that was so frustrating for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to the guardhouse, and you were, like, a pixel off from, like, trying to get those stairs up, and it's not even, it's not even, like, a puzzle, it's just, like, move these stairs, walk upstairs, push, like, it's, it's, it's just kind of a busy work thing. Exactly. And you got hung up there a while, didn't you? I, I did, I kept on, I pushed it back, I pushed it forth, I pushed it back, and because of the fixed camera, I couldn't see that there was half a, like, I feel like it was less than half a pixel between the wall and the steps and I had to push the steps all the way into the wall and that and I mean she didn't need the steps you could look at her she was tall enough she's very small she could have reached she's very it. short <laughs> she could have jumped she if you have a shotgun you can use the shotgun That's to right. reach up there worst case scenario uh, just she's got a shotgun you got a shotgun <laughs> oh my word yeah i will say i will give the game the version you're playing uh, not that this makes a difference it probably wouldn't have made a difference it's possible it would have been easier to see on one of the versions that has a little bit higher resolution um you are playing on the lowest crunchiest resolution version of the game on mm -hmm. the ds version so but probably not it probably would have been the same thing that was frustrating <laughs> all right uh <laughs> Austin, is it still fun? I'm having a good time. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean that's fair. I, I'm of course shocking. I'm having a blast. I love these games. I will say the first time I played Resident Evil One, I actually didn't finish it. I went on to go play some other games first. So it's possible that this becomes more fun once you're more familiar with some of the tropes. It's kind of fun in retrospect. Um, I don't know if that's just my taste in games, and I would have always loved it, or if. Um, uh, you know, Christian, you're going to come back later after playing some more and be like, actually, I see the appeal now. It just had a rough start, but it'll be interesting to see that later on. But yeah, as of right now, I'm having a blast too. So yeah. All right. Next one. Do you guys feel the cutscenes and story enhance or detract from the game? Austin. Oh, it, it makes the game for me. A good, <laughs> or a good portion of the game, it's enhancing because, like, again, I'm not immersed in the like horror aspect of it to me this is like a like a comedic campy survival game 
and the cutscenes mm-hmm. elevate that so well. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, all right, yeah, I definitely. I think this game is. I think this game is fun and good and enjoyable without the cutscenes, but I think it is elevated to one of my favorites because of that. Like I, like a lot. Part of me wants to give this game. I get. We'll get into it. Part of me would rate this game kind of low because it has a lot of rough edges and a lot of flaws and a lot of frustrations. But I can't stop thinking about it because of the memes. <laughs> it really. <laughs> I think it. Uh, and Christian, I think you've said this before, but tell me how you're feeling about those cutscenes. Uh, they make it better experience. I love them. They're great <laughs> cutscenes, and I need more of these cutscenes. <laughs> oh, you will get some. Yeah, good. And uh, I'll show you. S- <laughs> oh yeah, I'll show you some of the ones. Because the other thing is, yeah, uh, uh, we'll get into this in the second episode. But there's a lot of differences and little tweaks based on again what gameplay you do. And I'll show you a compilation of all the possible cutscenes you can get, so you get to see all the glory of Barry Burton. Okay, <laughs> good. I need to. I need to figure that guy out. All right, uh, so I guess I'll go first on this one, but I'm asking, but then I'm going to answer it. What has impressed you the most about this game? Um, I think for me, despite all of its rough edges, it's how well it does lay out design ethos. I agree that the execution isn't perfect, but a lot of the things that work in the games that I love the most, again, Cough Cough Remake, are set up here. It, uh, the stuff that is changed that makes this game work from one to remake isn't fundamental. It's not like the difference between Resident Evil 2 and then Resident Evil Remake 2, which are just like entirely different genres. The building blocks here work. They just needed some tweaking on the execution, is my opinion. And we see that because of Remake, where they tweak the execution just slightly. It's very still, it's 80% still the same game. And it becomes a, it goes from a game that I like pretty well to like one of my top five favorite games of all time ever. So I think it's impressive that so long ago, under such technical limitations and without a blueprint to look back on, they were able to at least get the building blocks of, of this entire genre, which took over the entire PlayStation 1 era of games. So many games were based off of this Parasite Eve, Silent Hill, you know, so many other games took inspiration from Resident Evil, and they managed to get that much right here. I think that's impressive. Uh, Christian, I know this game hasn't been impressing you a lot, and you can answer it was the cutscenes or whatever, but what's the thing that's impressed you the most about this game so far? I... I sound like a record, but it is, it is the cutscenes. I yeah, <laughs> di- I didn't expect them honestly. Going into it, I did not expect the fun, campy cutscenes, and it just it put me in a good mood from the start of the game. <laughs> that faded, but it started at least started off strong. <laughs> yeah, we 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 started off strong. <laughs> What about you, Austin? What's impressed you the most about it? Uh, this might be slightly cheating because technically the remake did this for me, but if Resident Evil 1 would have done the same thing for me as well if I started <laughs> with it, is the fact that it managed to, in a relatively short time, get me to appreciate and enjoy this really unique control scheme when mm-hmm. I went into it thinking, I hate this, this is the worst in every way, but it's honestly not. The control scheme and design that they set in place to make their game work was really well executed. Yeah. I that that yeah. I agree with that. That's a good one. Alright. Counter to that, you know, gotta have some balance here. Austin, what do you like in the least about this game? Uh hmm. The least I there's not anything that's really gnawing at me that's like this is really bad or, or bad that I want fixed other than maybe that I think the default control or like button mapping is a bit funky so maybe that's my least favorite part so far is the wacky yeah, no button remappable mapping. controls <laughs> yeah the menus really do feel wrong I guess you know one thing you got to avoid you could say is uh, maybe ink ribbons which you didn't have to deal with so <laughs> yeah I don't know if that would have been worse than the button mapping because I would have been expecting yeah, and used to the the safe ribbons at that point. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. Uh, Christian, be brutal, be honest. I want to hear the negatives because I, w- I think we need to be honest about that and I think it's fun that you have a different perspective on this. What are you liking the least about it right now? You can hit a couple things because it sounds like there's a couple frustrations here. Um, I mean, I, I do have a couple things and again, yeah. like you said, maybe 
part of this was covered in the manual, but the... And it's just me not being used to this style of a game, but the lack of initial direction of just kind of how long it took me to figure out you go into your bag and then you use items from there and if it works <laughs> yeah. then it does if not it doesn't instead of just clicking <laughs> on it um yeah, yeah. so there, there's that the controls again as i got toward toward the end of this round i felt like i was getting a better handle of the controls so the controls are not as bad i do the button mapping is a little weird um the those stairs really frustrated me <laughs> The stairs? Yeah. The, oh, the stairs in the guardhouse. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the guardhouse stairs. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally fair. I think what I enjoyed the least is, um. I don't like the stun locking dogs, and that's just because I got beat by them this time. I like being punished for mistakes or being over cocky. And I even knew those dogs were there, so, like, maybe I should... But, like, I... They should be able to hit you, but I went in with full health and just got backed into a corner and didn't even get a chance to heal or pull out a gun or anything just the way, like, it happened to happen. I wish there was a little bit more specificity on a, the, the placement. I think what what Austin had, which was, like, 2-2-2, two, two, and two, would have been more manageable because you couldn't have gotten stun-locked you know, three dogs in a row before you could react. So I guess I will say, and that's honestly a tampering with the American version, but I don't like how they increased the difficulty in the American version. It didn't feel like, oh, I lost those three dogs because, you know, like I, I sure I was cocky. I should have like gone in and saved first, but I kind of feel like you just turn a corner and three dogs stun lock you until you die is not a super f fun way. It didn't feel like I wasn't cautious enough. It just was like, I should have known they were there and I didn't and I kind of got punished for that felt a little bit of a beginner's trap so I guess I'll say because you guys have experienced this too some of the beginner's traps are a little bit frustrating in a game that does send back your progress so much it's not so bad on replays but that first time through it's fine when you go ah I should have seen that like the uh, the poison room one I'm sorry you you pushed them where you couldn't get them but the poison room one it's like I don't blame the game for that I think that's hey if you if you think ahead and are really cautious you can get it kind of same with the painting maybe but some of the other ones like not having not like you said not the lack of conveyance or not really explaining that the knife is useless um or that you can run away from the first zombie some of those things just kind of feel like beginner's traps and i i wish the game did a little bit better at kind of conveying its rules before throwing you into the blender i guess um yeah all right last two here uh, I get. I don't even know that I can answer this one because I kind of know already. But um, yeah, Austin, what are you hoping will happen in the second half of the game? I kind of already know what does. So yeah, but like I, the th uh, things I guess you don't know are the things you're hoping for even in this version. I am looking forward to um, experiencing this or classic versions of some of the upcoming boss fights. And seeing yeah. how that compares to the remake that I'm expecting. That's the best I got yeah. for you, man, because I, I kind of know I, the plot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, the plot's obviously not. That's why I like what well, the last question is only going to apply to Christian. I guess <laughs> I'll say what I'm hoping for in the second half is um, having obviously played this several times uh, that I don't make a, a doofus of myself and get killed again. Um, I know it's going to happen. I know the gameplay and the other stuff. But yeah, I'm hoping it's a smooth experience. I guess I'll say I'm hoping in the second half that Christian finally feels comfortable with the controls and it ends up being a smoother experience. Bit of a heads up, Christian, because you'll... But I guess I want to hear what you say and then I'll, I'll confirm one thing for you. But what are you hoping for in the second half, Christian? Hoping for in the second half? I'm hoping to just kind of be more comfortable in the game and uh, that it will be just a smoother ride compared to the first half now that I've kind of yeah. gotten some of those beginner traps out of the way um, I'm going to try every item that I can in every situation <laughs> and I'm not going to wander around for an hour looking for a red gem 
<laughs> you actually that's one of the things I wanted to say I'm going to slightly confirm this we'll see how your gameplay experience is but the second half of Resident Evil is significantly more linear and streamlined than the first half you kind of okay. stop wandering around big open spaces and start tackling um, a series of smaller more condensed spaces so bit more combat bit more resource management where you're still trying to decide how many guns to bring but you're not really wondering where to go for nearly as long for the rest of the game so okay. we'll see how that impacts your experience uh austin you and i are plot wise already know what is going to happen so i'm only going to ask this to christian got any other big predictions for like the plot and where it's going to go i i may be way off here and you guys may laugh at me mm -hmm. I think we're gonna kill Barry. Okay. I you think you're gonna fight Barry and kill him? I, I don't know why, but he's just what he, he's sus. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think happened to uh, Chris and uh, well, your team leader Wesker? Well, I know. I have a we haven't seen you haven't seen them in your playthrough, right? Uh, not not my playthrough. I have. Yeah. I mean, I. Having played some of Resident Evil 4 and some <laughs> yeah. of 5, I know that Wesker is... Don't say it. Don't tell him. <laughs> I I know th I know something is suspicious. Um, right. And I don't know what, what's going on with Chris. He may be suspicious too. Chris is suspicious too, huh? I, I don't Even know. Even though you were playing him in 5? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so your big prediction is we're going to kill Barry because he's secretly evil, right? I think we're going to kill Barry. I think that... Yeah, that's my main thing. I feel like okay. there are yeah. going to be more snakes falling out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. That surprised me. I didn't I didn't know there were going to be snakes. Yeah, um, yeah, they're sneaky. Why is it always snakes? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so your big prediction is we kill Barry. I think that's a good one. We'll come yeah. back and see next time. Well, fellas, thank you so much for doing this with me. This is one of my favorite series, and you guys are my favorite guys, and I am just so blessed to get to do this. So looking forward to hitting that next one. Next time we're going to finish the game. I know that's crazy to believe, but I think we're going to just blast through this next one, and I'm looking forward to see what it goes. Uh, my name's Dolan Malna. Good to meet you. My name's Austin. <laughs> no, you're supposed to do the. Yeah, I has. I always said it's me and then Austin and then Christian on this one. Remember? Do you not remember me saying that? I was trying to think of something funny. It took me a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, do you have a sign off? I got a shotgun. I got a shotgun. Okay. This is Christian. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Right. Love you guys. I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay.